And hello, everyone. Welcome to show number 104 of This Week in Hospitality Digital Marketing. I am your host, Lauren Gray. And we are now at our two-year anniversary for the show, uh, which is awesome. Uh, two years every week, rain or shine, traveling to China, traveling to Australia, traveling around the country or not. I've had the pleasure of working with some amazing co-hosts um, who I think mostly are on vacation right now. Uh, and because of that, <laughs> you may be having me on my two-year anniversary show by myself, which is also pretty okay for me anyway, because I just love to talk and there's a lot of cool stuff going on this week. I mean, we'll have some coffee. So here we are, two years, uh, making sure all of our, our programming stuff works well here. Uh, let me get turned on some stuff. There we are. We'll keep that active and alive for right now for audio on our Facebook Live and our Periscope Live. For those watching us on there, which uh, because I'm limited to screens today, I can't really see. Um, there we go. We'll go down that way. Have to turn down the audio a little bit so we don't get double feet on our live broadcasting. So with that, two years every week started this time in 2015. Uh, since starting the show, I've had the pleasure of having some great co-hosts, Mr. Robert Cole from Rock Cheetah, uh, Mr. Tim Peter from Tim Peter and Associates, um, uh, Mr. Edward St. Ange from Flip2, Ms. Holly Zoba from Signature Series Worldwide, and Mr. Stuart Butler from Field Travel are just a few of my regular co-hosts. Uh, also, I've had the pleasure of having several guests, special guest co-hosts over the course of the couple of years. Every two, maybe sometimes three weeks, we'll have a special co-host come join us. We've had anybody from Marriott's to Fairmount's to uh, product services to software platforms to uh, revenue managers, great revenue managers, uh, people from the HSMAI Revenue uh, Management Council, our board, I should say, the Digital Marketing Council, the HSMI America's board. And the reason why I mention all these boards and so forth is because we are an ardent supporter of HSMAI, which is the Hospitality Sales and Marketing Association International, which I have the pleasure of participating in on several capacities as on the Revenue Board, Revenue Council, Revenue Board, I keep saying that, Digital Marketing Council, and also the America's board. Uh, plus, I also get the pleasure of, of speaking at their uh, very successful Revenue Management Continued Education Training Program, or affectionately known as ROCKET, uh, which travels all over the country, including, might I say nicely, also Hawaii, uh, which was a wonderful trip to make. And the Hawaiian chapter is actually going to potentially be one of our special co-hosts, our uh, special features come September. We've decided we want to take this show in an interactive way to the chapters for HSMAI. And Hawaii has expressed a very strong interest uh, from my uh, trip out there to them of being the ones that come on, bring on the entire chapter, uh, occupy one of our rooms for those who have watched the shows, which by the way, we're on average over 1600 people per week watch this show from over 22 countries. Now I say over 22 countries only because the last time we went over and looked and pieced and so forth, we had 22 plus and we've had even more influx from others. We get questions from around the world, which is a, a sincere pleasure and honor that people watch the show and learn from the show and get guidance from the show because we bring to the show and we have over these past two years, um, news articles, things that are happening literally in the week. Now, if you've ever had the pleasure of co-hosting with us, you know this already. Um, we always leave an empty chair. So if somebody wants to join us from anywhere around the world, they can live video if they want or in the chat window on the, on the side. Um, and in that they get to ask questions or contribute to the conversation and give a great perspective addition as to what they're asking in the industry of hospitality. And we send out literally the night before, last night being the case, Thursday night, we send out an aggregation of all uh, the suggested topics that are of relevancy for this week. And we tend to grab bag those uh, and pick from those what we find to be most interesting to discuss. And, and, and ironically, we first tried to structure the show uh, going back a little bit in time to where we would do X amount of time for tools, X amount of time for techniques and case studies, X amount of time for newsfeed. And it turned into a more dynamic conversation by allowing us to free flow discussions associated with any of the topics that we had and not necessarily exhaust them to ad infinitum, but rather bring them to a conclusion. And, and that turned out to be the real value that we heard from our listeners and our followers was that they didn't get the canned, uptight, shortened, abbreviated, we didn't tell you everything, but you know, just a partial thing. We, we actually went through and looked at 
shaking it upside down and inside out and from every angle, what really was the news value associated with it? What really was the topic value associated with it from the weekly basis? And from that, we really got to enjoy the topics as they came along. Well, it looks like I have the pleasure of having some of my co-hosts join me. Uh, Mr. Stuart Butler, Mr. Tim. Hello, hello, hello. Gentlemen. How the heck are you today? I'm fantastic. You? Let me make sure my volume is up and running. Can you hear me okay? And I can hear you then. Okay. So, I'm, by the way, I just want to say right up front, I, I hate when people come in and say, so I just want to tell you right up front, and now I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, my cable, which is what my internet is, uh, Comcast is being Comcast, and I'm having troubles. So if I drop out at any point, I'm going to drop off and come back or whatever as I can. Uh, but I can't guarantee network connectivity, which has been a real treat all day. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll see how this goes. This could be interesting. Not a worry. Hey, Mr. Stewart, how are you, sir? Hey, guys. How's everybody today? Happy I am doing well. I thought I was going to be flying solo there for a little while, which, you know, I always have a problem talking or keeping up with stuff. So I was really getting nervous, right? I was like, wow, what am I going to talk about, right? <laughs> yes, we've often found you to have difficulty finding something to say. <laughs> <laughs> or wanting not to say something, right? <laughs> by the way, by the way, Stuart, your your ears must be ringing. I was just talking to one of my clients, and uh, I mentioned fuel, and uh, you know, she said, "Oh, I love their podcast. I listen to it every week." See, so, as do I. By the way, mm -hmm. we have at least three listeners. Which is good. <laughs> <laughs> The audience is growing. <laughs> Gentlemen, I want to I wish you, uh, thank you so very much. This is officially being a 104, our two year anniversary show. Yay, happy Yay. second anniversary. And I don't want to spoil any surprises, but I'm sending something to you all in the mail as affectionate original hosts of the show. Uh, oh. I decided to uh, squeeze a couple shekels or nickels or dimes together and, and I'm sending something just to commiserate the fact that you have been so generous with your time, your persistence, your consistency, and everything else I can throw in there in an instancy uh, for showing up on the show for all the times that you had and participated and contributing. So I sincerely thank you very, very much that we've been able to hit this milestone. Well, thanks. Thank you so much. And Lauren, thanks for doing this. This is a, a lot of fun. That's something I look forward to every week. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it, we, we wouldn't be here without you. So. Well, or at least the technology, although I did smoke my laptop last week by trying to do too much on one laptop. <laughs> I, I promised myself that once I get settled into Florida, which I'm in process of right now, of we literally have a garage sale, or one of our last garage sales going on right now. And this week is boxing up and loading the truck. So once I get settled into Florida and we rented some office space, I hope I will improve my technology supply so that I don't have to fight uh, technology to do the multicasting that we try to pull off on a regular oh, basis. Sure, so. sure. Cool. We'll see how it goes. Hey, did you all get a chance to purview the list of happiness that I threw around on some of the subject topics? I didn't know if you had a chance to peek at any of those. Yeah, and I've looked at most of them um, to some degree or other. So. Well, I'm glad you're here, Tim, because in, not to speak of things that you often can't speak of because of your close affiliation with this, but Wyndham decided to go the way of Marriott and Hilton with their timeshare. Yeah, yes, they did. Yes, they did. I'm... I'm you know, uh, as people here know, uh, and those of you who don't, you know, um, I am a Wyndham shareholder, so I usually avoid talking about Wyndham for that reason. And also my wife is very, very gainfully employed by Wyndham, so I avoid speaking about Wyndham too much for that reason as well. Um, but, I mean, in this specific case, you know, uh, what are you going to do? I mean, it's it, I, I'm, I don't know that this is a good move for any of the businesses that do this. I think this is driven more by the stock market than by what customers actually want or need or the like. Um, but go figure that companies who are dependent on the public markets are dictating their strategy based on what they think is good for the public markets. You know, I mean, I don't really have a lot to add to that. It's, you know, I'm not I'm saying sure. they're wrong. I'm saying they may be driven by a different set of incentives than what right. is ultimately in the best interest of the customer, right? Right, and then and, and to keep you safe and in the comfort zone for Wyndham, it wasn't so much <laughs> <laughs> Wyndham in particular as right. is the trend of this. Right. That uh, I mean, I know I've been uh, outspoken against it, saying 
this seems very bad long-term strategy to divest yourself of a channel of opportunity that looks like will uh, become a different value proposition in the future uh, rather than the present look of, hey, revenue numbers, ROI, below or above thresholds, public for interest, let's shed it so that we keep good good bottom line numbers. So yeah, uh, yeah. I, the, the, the flip side of it is I don't know that it's specifically harmful to consumers, you know, to guests. I don't, I don't think it's particularly pro or con from a pure, you know, from a pure guest standpoint. I don't know that it's, I think it is driven more by short term, you know, capital market strategy than it is by, you know, how do, how do, here's what I would love to see a company do, right? In a perfect world. Um, and, and to be fair, a core is trying to do this to some degree, but you know, I'd love to see somebody say, how can we be providing all the different types of accommodations that guests might be looking for in a holistic way that makes it, um, you know, beneficial to the guest at any, at regardless of what kind of accommodation that they're looking for. And instead of saying, well, we're going to split this into a clear, you know, pure play hotel company because the street can understand that. We're going to split this into a pure play timeshare because the street can understand that and the like. Um, the one thing that I'm, uh, you know, my understanding is that the folks who are doing this and then not specifically Wyndham, but uh, you know, I, my understanding is as Hilton does this and as others do this, you know, the rewards, the loyalty programs uh, continue to work across the various platforms. So maybe that's okay from a cut from a guest perspective. And as long as they do that, maybe that's okay. All right. They came out and said that the loyalty programs will be untouched and they'll, they'll yeah. enter into a, mm -hmm. an exclusive long-term agreement with each other. So I agree. I think from a consumer perspective, this is, very little, you know, in terms of impact, real impact, but it, it, it is about the stock market from what I can tell, you know, it simplifies both entities as, as a prospect for buying, but it also diversifies the risk. Well. So, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. A lot of people get rich from it. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and none of them are us. <laughs> What's with that? <laughs> uh, you know, if you look at my portfolio of stocks, it looks like I'm a tech genius. Unfortunately, when you look at the dollar amounts invested, I look like a poor tech genius because <laughs> it's like I look at it, it's like I bought Apple uh, oh, 10, almost 12 years ago when it was $78 a share. It's split four times since then. And it's yeah. phenomenal. I'm a yeah. genius for having bought it and sat on it this time. Unfortunately, the amount I bought for it is not going to bring me to the retirement world. <laughs> Did you guys listen to the Freakonomics podcast? They've done a couple of episodes. Yes, Freakon I love Freakonomics, yeah. Periodically. I, it's not one of my every every time listens, but yeah, I do listen to it periodically. The, the, the fallout of the last couple of episodes is basically they've looked at you know buying and selling stocks and, and having people do it for you, having brokers, versus just in, investing in an index fund. And, and they've said over the course of time, every time, they just invest in index funds. And, Yep. Well, you know, it's, I don't know if you guys know this. I actually started my career in digital at Charles Schwab. I worked for Charles Schwab during the dot com boom. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, that, that's actually, I don't know how deep down this rabbit hole we want to go. I'll do this really quick. I was a music major in college. I actually worked in the music industry for the first uh, six years of my professional life, five or six years of my professional life, not including my years in college and, you know, schlepping around in high school bands and things along those lines. Um, but, uh, um, uh, but I built my company's first website. I worked for a manufacturer of electric guitars and I was the work we were the wholesaler for, um, uh, a Kai professional digital audio products. And I built their first website uh, in the mid nineties. And then uh, um, a friend of mine was working for Schwab and they said, they're looking for anybody who knows anything about the web and this thing called the internet. And I said, well, I built a website. And they said, somebody at the company said, you built a website, come talk to us. Right now. <laughs> so, I spent, so I spent six years at Schwab. Nonetheless, I went to a lot of financial conferences and like, and I'm not providing financial advice. I'm not a broker. I'm not a dealer. You guys do whatever you want to do. Past performance is no guarantee of future results and all that other crap. See, they, objects appear closer than they are in the mirror. Everything. Yeah, they, they, they trained you. They trained us well. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but they they found again and again and again one of the biggest drains on your performance 
is fees. Mm -hmm. So the less you trade and the less you pay over the course of servicing the account, you know, on the long run, long law of large numbers, it all averages out to everything tracks with the market more or less, right? If you're sufficiently diversified and all that other kind of stuff, you know? Um, and so, yeah, fees will kill you. And somebody did a study. I can't, I think it was Fidelity or, or um, uh, one of those guys did a study and they discovered that the, the accounts that had performed the best over the last 10, 15, 20 years were the ones where the owner forgot they had an account there. <laughs> <laughs> right it just left it alone let it ride <laughs> and that just you know that just tracked with the market and it's done yeah. very very well it's the folks who've been trading and you know buying and selling and stuff are just chipping away a little bit at a time at their returns if for no other reason than the cost of the transactions right I, like <laughs> I, I have i have more of an analogy for the for the traffic driven people when you're driving down the road and the guy that's jogging between lanes and ducking and darting and dick you still pull us up beside him when the stoplight hits <laughs> right, right right exactly <laughs> doesn't get any farther by jumping around but yes right. to your point yeah. yeah. So anyway, anyway, sorry for that. <laughs> sorry for that digression. But see, I'm wearing my high school alumni uh, yeah. uh, shirt today, so I'm I'm in nostalgia mood. I think. Uh, okay. Okay. And, well, and, I, mean, and, I didn't actually know about the Schwab. I knew about the mu musical history and so forth. I mean, but I figured that's how you actually found your wife because you know women love musicians. Period. Heck, period. So so since I'm in nostalgia mode, <laughs> I, I I met my wife because a woman came into the recording studio where I worked at the time and said, "I'm going to be on Broadway." And I was like the most jaded, like 24 year old in history. And I was like, great, you brought a check that's going to clear, right? Because I don't <laughs> care. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and she turned out to be an amazing singer. And so I started talking to her. And one thing led to another. And we went out on a couple of dates. And uh, over time, I came to realize she wasn't a very nice person, but her friend, Tammy, was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I have to give credit to musicians. That's how I met my wife. I had a three. I had a little jazz bistro downtown uh, St. Petersburg, and a group of girls kept coming in that followed this trio that I kept bringing in, and I liked one of them, so I kept bringing in the trio, making them quote the house band. Yeah, and I just kept buying her beer until she finally said yes. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah, Stuart, yeah. All right. Stuart, you want to share your romantic? Oh, yeah, what's going on, Stuart? I have no musical talent, so I can't join in that conversation. Oh, I lived off Austin's most. Well, I had you no know, musical talent. I just had the ability to make sure the musicians were hanging around. <laughs> hey, guys, clearly I had no musical talent. I worked as a marketer now. <laughs> but you have amazing technology, digital marketing talent. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Nonetheless. Hey, uh, it just and I didn't put this in the list of articles to pick from, but I do it just it, to switch a little bit on the political side of things. Um, I'm, I'm really amazed that the industry hasn't started talking about the ramifications of how they're changing the immigration policies, long term effects, current oh, effects. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because of all industries that have this symbiotic relationship with immigration or talent pools and so forth, hospitality is one of the stronger ones. And so yeah. it's kind of what, it, like, why aren't we as an industry either saying something or at least even dialoguing about what does this mean now and future forward, you know? Yeah, so it's interesting because on the ground, people have been talking about it for a while. I think back, I mean, even when Trump was first elected, people were speculating and, and concerned about the position the U.S. was putting itself in. As someone who literally just renewed his green card this this past week, I'm pretty relieved that these changes aren't happening anytime soon. Wait, you're a foreigner? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm <laughs> I thought you were from Texas. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of people are con legitimately concerned of low, you know, low level yeah. employees. A lot of them are coming from abroad, and it's not just going to affect tourism, but it's also going to affect the the pool of talent in um, mm -hmm. places. If you look at like Myrtle Beach, they rely in the summer because there's such a peak in, in visitation, they have to get all these J-1 visas over here. And I mean, this could be a big problem for them. Right. You, it, I, you know, it's funny. There was an article earlier this month. Uh, I'm putting a link to it right now. Um, that, that at least according to research, nobody's seeing any impact to travel demand. You know, I, so I'm going to be a focus group of one for a second, which of course is always dangerous. But I was down in Orlando last week um, on, on vacation. And, it, you know, as is always the case, Orlando gets an immense amount of overseas travel in. And 
you couldn't you couldn't have um, there was there was no indication that it, that it had had an impact from a traveler perspective. So yeah, I I I, I am very pro immigration. I will be the first to admit this. I, I'm incredibly pro immigration. I think Thank you for your support. I appreciate well, it. hey, no worries, man. Well, with some exceptions, but. Uh, <laughs> Case, case by case, Stuart. Case uh, by case. Uh, it may not be hospitality driven, but it is in some circumstances. Over here locally in Texas, there's been three items that have made the news that are directly impacting. One, of course, non hospitality is from the farming season right now. Oh, sure. uh, food is rotting because there's nobody sure. to pick or grow. Sure. That's not hospitality, but it is a food supply chain issue. The second is uh, Plano, which is in, in enormous growth. One of the reasons why we're able to sell our house so quickly that we did and so forth is because of the massive amount of moving in. Rents are astronomically high. Housing's even higher. Mm -hmm. Anybody that works in the mid to low level uh, skill set industries, hospitality included, restaurant, they, there's nobody to hire. They're right. having to almost right. double their base hourly salary in their franchise system just to try to get people because the people have to travel so far in now right. to work because they cannot afford to work within the radius that they're working in. Right. And so that that has a thing to it too. But uh, to your article too, I would, I would contest a little bit and I only say this from a client's perspective. There's two clients I have in two destination markets, New York being one of them, mm -hmm. and their traffic international from their source markets, their traffic is actually diminishing that we created a fail safe marketing program Mm. Uh, of what do we do to replace inter international demand for them? Now, a lot of moving pieces, demographic profile, price strata, lots of mm -hmm. things that can be varied on this. And I can say that the client in particular for one of the accounts is on the lower price scale. So mm -hmm. because of that, the more afforded traveler, their market interest has gone down. Now, the affluent traveler internationally, maybe you, it's true, there is no dip or move, but for the budget International traveler, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. have seen the traffic demand go down right now for long-term bookings. Which, which can be, you know, and that's a great point because, you know, this article was published about a month ago, and, uh, you know, travel, some stuff, especially international travel, does tend to have a longer booking window and the like. So maybe just the leading indicators, mm -hmm. maybe the trailing indicators haven't caught up to the leading indicators. Yeah, yet. I think New York had there was an article about New York demand probably about a month or two ago that they said the same thing that demand from international was down, but overall demand was up because there was right. increased domestic demand. So, right. Yeah. Right. Well, New York's also going through kind of a rate compre uh, de depression right now. There's yeah. a lot of mid and upper tier that are dropping down at least a category or one or two in their pricing strategy, which is pushing those people down farther with, you know, the typical well, revenue. And there's, a lot, and there's a lot, and there's a lot of Airbnb in New York. There's a lot of Airbnb, Airbnb, especially event driven stuff. And then there's yeah. also some new inventory that's been coming in yep, that's uh, right. that are making unique strides like that little pod thing that's going on in Times Square now, uh, you know, just little stuff like that that's yeah. hitting highlights. So yeah, in that sense, there are some of those impacts for well, and And broadening the discussion just for a moment away from the immigration side or away from the international side, I mean, we are due for, I, I, I'm not making any prediction that it's going to be this year. I'm not making any prediction that it's going to be next year. But I mean, you know, travel has been very strong over the last four or five years, you know, pretty much since what, 2011 or so, uh, 2012, we really started to come out of the 2008, 2009 nightmare in a big, big way. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, you know, you all know the cycle. I'm not saying anything anybody here doesn't know of of, you know, demand is crap, inventory falls out of the market because people close or what have you. Um, that cycle then creates some benefit for the folks who remain because supply falls below demand. The, the business cycle starts to upturn, demand comes up further, that puts more pressure on supply. We need more supply, so more supply starts to come in the market, which takes time. And at a certain point, you know, uh, uh, hotel supply, room supply is always a trailing indicator, right? Always a trailing indicator. And so a lot of the supply that's coming online now is the stuff that's going to tip us into the next down cycle, mm -hmm. right? Because it's going to, because it's going to exceed, it's going to exceed demand or in some markets like New York may already be exceeding demand. So we're due for a, you know, not correction, but just the cycle to go through the downslope. You know, yep. I'm sure we all try to do for our clients is make that the other guy's problem, 
right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, supply is a trailing indicator and there's a lot of supply coming online in a lot of places. So, and that's, I, that's certainly going to trigger some softness. And it's funny that Robert's joining because he can probably speak to this uh, to some that's degree. Cool. Robert, we were just talking about the, the, the swing in room supply and it's, you know, potential ah. impacts on, 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 uh, putting the cycle into its downside, you ah. know, and, and that we're my, my, my premise is that we're, we're getting pretty due for that in many markets. You know, I don't well, know. If, I don't know if you have specific research that might, I, I have a bunch of that, but I only dropped in because I have to drop off in two minutes to set up another thing. I'm just, I'm like Tim Peter. I'm very busy today. Oh, for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> But I was very worried that Lauren might be having his second birthday alone. That's right. Be not, yeah, oh, would be a thank horrible. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank and, you and like thanks. any any two year old's birthday, um, tantrums. You, know, you expect tantrums. You know, people people yeah tantrums, people difficulty walking, <laughs> probably periodic <laughs> vomiting, and uh, of course somebody's inevitably going to soil themselves. Uh, well, that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Thank you for putting that all in perspective. <laughs> and, 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 Lauren, and and of course, Lauren has you know repeated that pattern off of every birthday since his second. So. <laughs> I, yeah, I do actually. Yes, <laughs> well, at least the staggering around and, and being incoherent part. But that's another story. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, but I will. Uh, I will try to get off of this thing um, in an hour or so. I'm sure you two will. You three will still be going. Uh, I don't know. Uh, without, without, you know, it's 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 hard to say. You you're usually a good catalyst for the continuity, so it could oh, go either way. I didn't provide know. any news, so sorry about so, that. So Robert, <laughs> before you go, I know you got to drop in just two minutes, but no, no, I need to drop now. Oh, <laughs> oh, damn it. oh bye. 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 He that, that was just a tease. That was just a tease so, presentation. So, Stuart, from your perspective, I mean, can you talk about what you're seeing in terms of, you know, supply, demand, you know, pressures, et cetera? Yeah. I mean, I'm seeing the same thing in the markets because we, we have real heavy concentration in resort destinations. Yep. And, you know, so it, it's, it's been a while, but you're right. We're starting to see more inventory being built and coming on to the beginning to open. And still, it is a it is a, an indicator that people have been doing well, but it's going to hit saturation in a lot of the markets. And then you couple that with political uncertainty and then international threats from from people like North Korea who are trying to provoke a fight, uh, probably <laughs> the wrong president, to be honest. Um, so, I, Boy, <laughs> there's a straight line, by the way. Um, well, if there's any president that one. you don't want to call his back, I'm not saying politically right or wrong. I'm just saying. It's no, 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 I know. I'm no, sorry. but I think you're right about that. that there's um, a temperament issue there, yes. Yeah. Um, so I think all it's going to take is one big uh, international incident, and, and it's going to throw travel into turmoil on top of an increase in demand. And it's still, it seems to be increasing, you know, so or an increase in supply. So yeah. I think, yeah, we it's probably a year or two out, but we're going to start to see a downturn. But having uh, said that, I think if you're a savvy marketer, rest assured that over 70 percent of the hotel industry are not savvy marketers and they're doing that's a right job you know so if you're in that top 30 percent you're probably going to be okay you know that's right yeah so that's, that's and then to, right. to that end there was an article that i shared and i'll throw the link up for too because I, I dug some other stuff and i didn't share it in the uh in the notes with it because i was just pulling it up because of this article and it was talking about how the smith travel report uh a star now we shouldn't call it smith travel anymore uh it cited chicago orlando dc as the top meeting planner locations but and I wish again, Robert, we're going to have to ask him to come back on this, I guess, sure. um, was the 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 numbers seemed lower to me in the sense of expectations and draw. And so I started looking at because I have I have a couple of clients that are towards the the uh, East Asian APAC area and they're promoting tremendous amount of internal travel, internal meetings. Australia is in particular what I'm talking about. And and at best, a lot of meeting planners out of the Indo-Asian area are, are tailoring to Australia. So I started looking at the European market. They're offering a lot of, of green credits because that's an advocacy mm -hmm. within the organizations that are going on that we are absolutely seeming to be ignorant of. Um, there's a lot of internal of keeping it in, traveling in, staying within uh, uh, marketing that's going on in both the APAC and in the EU about rather than doing the U.S. travel and venture. Because when, I, like I said, when, you know, you look at Chicago, Orlando, DC. I think it's because they're major gateways. Obviously, they're major well, locations. But I have a 
But I have a question about that. And, and to be candid, I don't follow the meetings and events side of the industry as closely as I follow other sides, right? So this is not necessarily my strongest area. But I've been around the business for, what, 17 years now. I speak professionally all over the place, right? This cannot be that different from last year or the year before or the year before that. In, you know, Chicago, Orlando, D.C., San Diego, Las Vegas being the top destinations for meetings and events. Yeah. That's shocking to me. Wait, right. I, that can't be that different from what it is, I don't know, no, every don't know. other freaking year. Right. I don't <laughs> think it's the, that's the thing I'm saying. It's not right? the difference of it. But I treat it, I think it's more like because I see the marketing shift in the two, the Apex and the use is that it's kind of like musical chairs. There's one less chair, one less chair, one sure, less chair. Sure, so sure. there's this growing to what you're saying, Stuart, this growing something's going to happen eventually. The music's going to stop somewhere and there's yeah. going to be enough places to hide. And there's going to be this. And I think with everything that's going on the way Stuart just eloquently described it, is that a lot of the people are staying in the EU this year where they might have ventured into the U.S. Oh, conferencing. OK, or APAC might have decided to come into the Hawaii market or whatever, because I have a person in Hawaii as well. And they're saying that their interest level is also down when it comes to meetings and events planning. There's their their windows. There's no real long term bookings. It's all compressed down by at least another 14 days in their mind as to doing these meeting events, plan bookings for 90 plus days out. And it's just it seems like they're everyone's kind of sucking up there and holding their breath for a minute to see what is going to happen. Is something going to happen? If so, when? apprehension i think is what i'm saying so i just like I said the stats when they pulled up it just seemed like okay yes this is normal but is it at the same volume of interest that they had anticipated well one thing that stood out for me on the article was one of the biggest um, decision factors of where they where people were holding their meetings was safety of the location i'm like mm. okay, this mm. is like second i don't know this, this yeah. is ignorance of the city but the reputation is not one of safety for sure right Right, I'm surprised yeah. Vegas wasn't higher, honestly, because most of the folks I know that are on the speaking circuits that do a lot of yeah. conventions and things. I mean, it's Orlando and Vegas, and, and, and maybe even Phoenix is one that they, they say a lot. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that mm -hmm. they're hitting. So mm -hmm. I'm surprised Phoenix wasn't higher as well. No, and sense. Nashville, for that matter. Nashville's really created a presence for itself. Nashville's Granted, well, it doesn't have the square well, footage space, but it has the attention. Yeah. Well, and by the way, I mean, the other thing we should point out in this article is they, they specifically spoke to folks who are looking for um, – a thousand plus attendee meetings. Right. So, I mean, this is, you know, yeah, there candidly, there aren't a lot of markets that can digest that kind of volume period. Right. So I, again, the, the list of cities just can't be that different that often. Right. right. Um, uh, anyway, I, I had a question for you, Stuart, specifically. Well, a question for all of us, but Stuart, you said something a moment ago um, that holds with what I was also thinking. You know, you mentioned most people in this industry just aren't savvy marketers. You know, I I look at downturns as opportunities That's from the standpoint of stealing share from your competitors, right? Um, you try to get good when things are good so that you're in better shape when things are bad, right? Um, and I'd just love to hear, you know, I think Fuel does a great job of this. Lauren, I know you do a great job of this. I certainly like to think that I do a pretty good job of this. Um, but you know, we, we try to make downturns be the competitor's problem. For sure. Uh, you know, just love to hear your thoughts on that, Lauren, love to hear your thoughts on that and how you approach this. If we're moving towards things getting a little softer, you know, what are the kinds of things people should be doing now to prep? What are the things that they should be doing when they hit a downturn to think about? Yeah. I mean, we, we look at, if I go back to 2008, 2009, when everything tanked before, <laughs> the, the guys that were ahead of it and, and knew, you know, predicted that this was going to come, they, they were focused on building up their own assets. You know, the email database still is, it, and even today, is still the number one asset that a property has if, if it's done right, right? If you manage yeah. it correctly yeah. and you don't abuse it. So building owned assets beyond, um, you know, email, but also looking at social and, and, and physical addresses even now because we've seen an uptick in, in the behavior from people from direct mail because they're not saturated like they were and you, there's technology that lets you personalize and things like that. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think investing in knowing your guest now and understanding what motivates them and what differentiates you from your competitors that makes them choose you at this point. Because what we, our strategy when it turned in 2008, 2009 was let's spend more. You know, let's let's outspend the competition. 
invest in the product, the experience, but also in the reach and the, the advertising side. Because not only were the competitors pulling back on spend, but they were on advertising, but they were also letting their product go downhill as well. So we, we ended up in a situation where we had a better product with more reach. So our, our percentage of market was increasing to the point where a lot of our clients ended up buying their competition and coming out of the recession yep. with more assets and they were paying pennies on, on the dollar for it. You know? yeah. So yeah. That, that's what, what we're hoping happens again, honestly, when the down, even when a downturn happens is that our clients come out stronger and they end up mopping up the competition. Right. Absolutely. I, I just posted a link. I'm glad you mentioned email. Um, so I worked for leading during the, the, the last downturn and we got hit hard by it. I, you know, for reasons like um, we ranked organically number one for luxury hotels, right? Organic search was a, was a, not a, not, well, obviously it was huge for us, right? A, a big part of our strategy, et cetera. We were over indexed in organic search and we knew it. We were in the process of trying to grow other things right when somebody kicked the chair out from under us. Yeah. And the problem we ran into was we ranked number one for luxury hotels organically and, and similar types of terms. And what happened was people stopped searching for luxury hotels, right? They started searching for cheap hotels and discount hotels and really cheap hotels and really, really cheap hotels, right? And, you know, it had a real uh, negative impact on us. Our traffic at leading, I think I can say this, the statute of limitations being nine years ago, um, you know, our traffic dropped 35 to 40% in a week. Mm -hmm. Like, and because it was just gone, right? <laughs> Nobody was searching for the thing we ranked for. Um, and email was huge for us in helping because we had a good database and we were good with using it. Um, we were able to do a lot of things in terms of value add promotions so, where exactly we do it to a closed user group, right? It wasn't necessarily rate driven, even though sometimes on the back end, it very much was rate driven, you know, right. three, three nights for the, the price of two, uh, things like that. But also, it didn't become a publicly available rate where you set a new expectation of what this property was worth. And I, the last thing I'm going to say, and then I'm, I'm give you guys a chance to say something on this, but um, I just posted a link. Fuel in their podcast did an excellent, excellent episode about email just the other day, uh, episode 59. So I just posted a link to that that has a ton of great tips and things people should learn how to do so that if there is, in fact, another downturn, just great tips and tricks in there that I highly recommend. You just yeah. took all my thunder away. You know that, right? <laughs> well, I, <laughs> just just call, just call me Thor. Let's see. Let's see. Let me just see if I could scrape something together that you didn't hit on those being excellent. Okay. <laughs> so, so here's you asked the original question: What are we facing? What we're we doing? There's two aspects. I think I'll say personally about what I'm doing with clients right now. One is. Uh, and a keen interest in being aware of what your current situation is by through an audit process. And that audit process scaled to what it is that you're looking to discover. Current present and awareness, competitive set evaluation, or complete, you know, through an exit, out the enter, uh, evaluation of every detail associated with your online presence. Because you can't make decisions if you don't have awareness. So to me, that's one of the things that I'm finding that uh, more and more clients are interested in is that evaluation process from a pay perspective, organic perspective, service and compatibility perspective with whom they're using, competitive set analysis, what their competitors are doing, a presence about knowing what's going on. That's first. The second is there is a maturation going on on software supportability of things. You mentioned automation. And yes, to your podcast, Stuart, excellent stuff. And like I'm, I, I'm actually playing with the program right now out of Zapier. And I don't know if anybody's familiar. No, I know you guys are, but you know Zapier is. It connects the dots between incongruous softwares. It it allows softwares that aren't built together to work together, and it's like connecting dots basically, which is why I love the thing so much. And they have a program for email, a specifically that I'm messing with that just blows my mind. It's called Lead Score, and what it does is it connects to your prosumer level email campaign stuff, your mail Mailchimp's, your constant contacts and stuff. It zaps it. It's called a zap connecting it to you guys know. And what it does is it goes out and in its service profile will take your data and begin to cue it for lead scores. What is it that this email, what else can you find out about this email? It'll gen out if it, there's an address related to it, a phone number related to it, a location related to it, a purchase related to it. And it begins to cue this data and categorize it so that you then begin to profile better 
your email list you have, other than just having, if you're lucky enough to have first name and email and hopefully zip code, it expands it beyond that. Purchase history, cycles, things that is, location. And it really begins to help you refine that personalization. Stuart, you mentioned your podcast so well. It's about defining the value relationship of that individual to your product, not just to hammer them that they happen to be X gen demographic and stayed with you one time, but rather you know more about them to tailor your message more specifically to them. And this is all the fundamental stuff we keep talking about. It's not the shiny new object stuff. It's getting better at the basics. So that's my two points is you made both great points about the email usage, refinement of personalization. There's a maturation of softwares out there that are getting affordable and usable that aren't enterprise only level or big scale level only or brand only. And there's also the, the doing your awareness and, and understanding your presence and making decisions from that information. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Good. I mean, I think if anyone's listening and, and they're, they're thinking about their marketing budget for 20, the end mm. of 2017, 2018, and they're looking at things like chatbots and they're looking at AI and augmented reality and all this whiz bang stuff that's bright and shiny, stop. And before you put a dollar to any of that stuff, make sure you're on a man. Yep. Hey, me. <laughs> <laughs> um, your paid advertising is, is in good shape. Do that first and then think right. about those things. Yeah, we we have touted for years, uh, actually going back to Schwab, this idea of co core and explore, right? Think 80-20. Yeah. You know, sure, you want to save some 20% or 10% or whatever for playing with cool new toys. Fabulous. Do that. But for God's sakes, get your blocking and tackling done correctly. You know, your email marketing program has to work. Your your SEO has to work. Your content has to work right you have to have the right content and the like yeah. make sure whatever your budget is for photos for next year double it yes period like i don't care what number you have double the damn number right now <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah for sure and it's amazing to me the number of people we come across that are spending heavily on on advertising you know they're doing a ton of display which i'm not a huge fan of but yep. They're, yep. they're doing a ton of things like adwords and they're sending all this traffic back to their website. And then you pull up the website and it's not even mobile responsive. You know, right. they're booking in, doesn't, it barely functions on a mobile device. And you're like, you're speaking of, of money straight away. Speaking of, I don't know if you guys saw this. I just saw this this morning. I, I think it came out earlier in the week, but I just came across it this morning that uh, Facebook has is changing its algorithm and if your website is not mobile responsive, if your website is too slow on mobile, et cetera, you're going to lose reach in Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, been, it's been rumored, but it was announced, yes. But yeah. it was announced, yeah. So if people, then they should have been scared years ago when Google started penalizing. <laughs> well, no, right, right. <laughs> if that wasn't enough warning, yeah. right. Right. But, but, you know, but I hear people all the time, A, Stuart, First off, first off, golf clap for everything you said a moment ago, because yeah. damn straight. I, absolutely. Um, and then secondly, you know, I still run into people who are like, well, yeah, but Google's making it, make it hard. Social is what's going to save us. You know, so, you know, social, we got a better opportunity. And, and social's great. I'm in favor of social. But what's going to save you is by doing the things that you're supposed to do correctly. Right. Yes. There, there, there used to be a... a football coach, uh, Marty Schottenheimer. Uh, was coach Kansas City Chiefs for a long time. And he once he once said, you know, the way you win a division in football, trust me, this is going to come back to business in a second, but th th he said the way you win your, the way you make the playoffs in football is um, very simple, right? You have to win the games you play at home. You have to win the games you play in your division. And you have to beat the teams you're supposed to beat. Mm. Right? And, okay, and he was kind of being half sarcastic or half facetious because obviously it's hard to do all three of those consistently. But the one that always stuck with me was you have to beat the teams you're supposed to beat. Yep. Like, you cannot go out and lose the game to the people right. who suck at it. Right? <laughs> and... You know, when we think about SEO, when we think about content, when we think about having a mobile responsive site, when we think about um, um, email, sorry, somebody's wandering through the <laughs> background of the shot over here. Um, when we think about those things, and very much, yes, you can make coffee. It's not going to bother anybody. Um, <laughs> I'm sitting in my kitchen today. Um, 
Uh, but w if you're not doing those things, you're going to lose to the teams you're supposed to beat. You know, you're, you got to win the games you're supposed to win and you're supposed to win email because it's your customer. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you got to right. win content because it's your opportunity to tell your story. If I can, I can throw one more thing in that, that kind of lends to what Stuart just said. And of course, reemphasize what you said, and that is do what you should do well at first. And that is you have to give good guests. I mean, we're in the business of hospitality. We give good guests business, which answers one of the more fundamental impacts to whether you rely upon social, look at social heavily or not. It's a reality of engagement that people have now. If you don't do good guest satisfaction, guest you know, quality with what you're doing, it will get reflected in communications and reviews, and it will hurt you no matter where you want to go and what you want to say, because everyone's going to look up and say, Hey, that's a great ad. It's a cute ad. It's great. You spend a lot of money for it. And then you look up at the review and you, you're, you suck. Right. Right. And that's I'm not going to go there. Get, no matter how much I thought I was going to get a great deal or not, I'm just, it's not worth it. What I'm seeing as a review to it. And, and to that end, you just have to do good hotel work, you know? Uh, right. and, and, and the review process is critical because I absolutely, I, I just, I just had a conversation with a client there. They, they had some need periods. And I'll be actually candid about this just to show that there's a reality to our, our conversation about hospitality. They forgot to accrue correctly their wholesaler contribution denials. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot of ghost inventory on the books that was looking like it was coming through. So they started doing compression tactics on their rates, only to find out that when the accounting office went over and readjusted the accrual of the cancellations, they had a huge holes in markets that they thought they were pretty solid, or not markets, but timeframes that they thought they were pretty solid in. So their whole rate strategy got thrown up in the air like, oh, crap. We shouldn't be asking this rate because, hey, you know, um, <laughs> we, don't, we can't justify it. So anyway, um, so they come back and say, hey, we want to spend more money doing the ads. And we've been keeping a very tight leash on performance as a key indicator of what we spend. Mm -hmm. You know, they say, you know, we'd ask for budgets like, sure, you don't want more. It's like, no, this is the money that are going to get us the yield factor. We can spend more money, but it's going to diminish our return on value. So anyway, they just said, we need to really pump this up. Can't you just add more money? It's like, yeah, we can always spend your money easily. The problem is your conversion factor that you've been very happy with is going to go down very quickly and it's not you're going to end up spending more money for less value proposition to it. It's not worth it. Let us just spend the money we know we get the conversion value on and look at other channels that we can find that similar conversion on as an expansion of budget, but not just to throw money at it and say, oh, if we spend more, we're going to get the same level of business. No, you're not. Right. You're, right. Going to get, you're going to get a third and half and a quarter of what you were getting before. So, yeah. Right. Which, depending on where you are, to be fair, there are times where I will tell people, yeah, you should spend more money. Oh, even yes, of though, course. Even though, and I want to be really clear about this. This is definitely one of those that there's so much nuance about. It's, I always, I, I'm always loathe to just say it as a blanket statement. But, you know, uh, one of the things that I see with a lot of folks when you walk in the first time is the amount of business that they get on branded terms, right? Whether it's organic search, whether it's paid search, whether it's email or whatever. And, you think about most independent hotels, most individual hotels and the stuff and the like, most people have never heard of you, right? I mean, fundamentally, a lot of people have never heard of you. So if you're getting most of your business from people who've heard of you, clearly something else is the thing that caused them to hear about you in the first place. And so we do play with, okay, sometimes we're going to spend money on things that are top of funnel that don't convert because it actually creates the demand that comes back and books on a branded term and the like. So mm -hmm. this is a little nuanced and it's something that, you know, exercise caution, don't just blindly throw a whole bunch of money to a whole bunch of things. You test, you, you, you know, isolate traffic, et cetera. Um, um, but, but overall, I agree with you, Lauren, with the nuance that there are times where we want to say, okay, we need to fill the top of the funnel in a different way. And so how are we going to do that in a very conscious way, knowing that it's not going to produce when we spend that money, what it is going to do is produce as it goes downstream. Right. What kind of question, what questions do you get asked, Stuart, when it comes to like crisis? Oh my gosh, you know, we got need more money. What can you do for us kind of thing? What kind of short-term buttons do you, when levers do you pull that you know you can get effect with besides just amping budgets or, you know, spending more money or something what else do yeah, you do to... the first we always go to their email database and, and look at their guest history and see how they, they've been using it because because it's the, it's the quickest button to hit if if it's done right um and then we'll look at spending money on on adwords and on even some broader term adwords if we're doing things like um retargeting stuff mm -hmm. like that the, the remarketing list for search ads 
things like that. So we, we tend to shy away from display. We just, we haven't seen it have, even though it's a top, very top of funnel um, thing, like you were saying, and the, and the return is lower. I just, I'm, I haven't found that, that attribution model that I'm comfortable putting my, you know, my name behind yet. So programmatic makes it a little more interesting with the AI side and the bidding, but we tend to stick to what we know works. So recently things like social advertising has worked a little better if we want to just get a boost, if you're targeting the right kind of demographics. Right. But at the end of the day, it comes back to email. And then we always try to see if we can, the, the traffic you're already getting, how can we do a better job of creating a mousetrap that works? You know, So we're always going to look at the website. Is it doing a good job? So say someone's coming to us and they, they have a 65% reliance on OTAs, right? Which which is not uncommon in, in right. the industry. We'll say, well, what are you doing to convince a guest that comes to your site? Because we know they're looking at your site and the OTA, but they're choosing to book on the OTA. So what, what are you doing on your site to convince them? You know, is the experience good? Is it mobile friendly? Is it um, compelling copy? You know, are you giving them a reason to book with you versus the OTA? Price is in parity, hopefully. So what, what can we do? So we got folks that are, you know, doing value adds. If you book direct, you get, you know, earlier check-in or higher speed Wi-Fi or a video game card for the arcade or food credits, stuff like that. So really making sure you're pushing that message hard can immediately swing things in your favor in terms of not necessarily total occupancy, but certainly what percentage are coming from OTAs versus direct. And if, if they're coming direct, you're saving 15% on every one of them, plus, at least, you know, so... Those are kind of the, the, the block and tackle kind of first level things we'll look at. But then we try to get into if it's more of a longer term relationship. Operationally, where are they deficient? Because like you said earlier, reviews are, are critical. You know, not only can higher review scores increase ADR, but they're going to dramatically increase your occupancy because people, a lot of people have a criteria. They're not going to get a property that's below a certain score or sometimes they're only going to do it below a certain score at a certain price point. So online reputation is critical. So folks, the hotels that are doing it right, they realize that operations and marketing is really one thing now in that operations is the best form of marketing. marketing. Mm -hmm. Get the hospitality right. The rest of it is just shining a light on what you do right, and, and you tend to get more heads and beds that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I posted a link since we're... You know, we haven't been playing much bingo today, but I posted. <laughs> uh, first off, again, golf clap because I completely agree with every single word that Stuart said. When I, by the way, when I mentioned budget before uh, and spending more budget, definitely never. Well, I shouldn't say never. Almost never on display. It's usually been things like broader terms that we wouldn't necessarily yeah. bid on. You know, things like the market as opposed to. Yeah. you know, this hotel or things like that. Um, al social advertising. Um, we're having some success doing things with um, spending money in social to drive traffic yep. that then retargeting turns into the, mm -hmm. the conversion, right? And using using uh, a retargeting audience of only the people who came in from that stuff. So we're actually mm -hmm. able to buy some traffic cheap because social is cheaper than paid search for right. the for the broader reach, but the retargeting is the thing that then brings them back and closes the sale. Yeah, there's different um, kinds of retargeting, right? Because yeah. one of the best, most effective things we've done with retargeting is exactly what you say, spend money on social to drive traffic to your site and hit them with a Google remarketing list for search ads right. list pixel. And then you can then target broader keywords, like you said, because if, mm -hmm. you're, if you're a small independent hotel and you're currently bidding on, say, say you're in Orlando, right? If you're bidding on Orlando hotels, the ROI on that is going to be terrible. It's going to suck. Right. Someone's <laughs> not made a decision, kind of not narrowed it down yet, right? So you're going to get a, probably a less than one to one return. But then if you're hitting someone that's already aware of your brand, if they come to your website and then you bid on those keywords, you, you have a good chance of getting a positive ROI. Right. Right. Right, because they turn into the custom audience. You blinked out wow. the person. Um, the the, okay, the link I posted real quick, uh, just just the link I posted. Uh, one of the most popular blog posts I have ever written, called "The Single Most Effective uh, Way to Grow Your Brand uh, to Improve Your Brand's Digital Marketing," and it's entirely about ratings and reviews uh, because fundamentally, word of mouth is more powerful than anything, and right. having other people have positive experiences. 
is going to do wonders for you. All of the properties that I work with, yeah, all the properties I work with, we tend to index around 96, 98-ish in terms of occupancy. And we tend to index around 110, 115 in terms of rate. Um, and the reason that they're doing that is because we win the ratings game. Mm -hmm. You know, so we get our fair share of the rooms in market, but we get them at a much higher rate and they're more profitable, which gives them more money to spend on marketing or improving the service of the property. Yeah. Uh, just because I'm feeling like happy thoughts on you know, my two year anniversary thing going on. here, with this, <laughs> um, I'll show you a very interesting secret. Why I can't believe it's been so successful method in a destination market that worked for us. We started scraping, scraping airlift rates for the feeder mm -hmm. markets. Mm -hmm. And this came out of inspiration because of the success using a DAR and Sojourn. And there, there's, there's a mixed bag with those. One of the, they are a solution in some markets that you can help with depending on airlift because the data that they draw from is a specific to destination value and so forth. But that's another conversation, but they're, they're a great easy button or lever to, to margin up or margin down depending upon your need cycles. They're more of a long range pickup. But anyway, um, so we started scraping airlift rates and uh, traffic coming. And then we started seeing an interesting correlation to language cycle on the site because we are multilingual to the site as well. Mm -hmm. We start correlating the not not just the lift, but the interest uh, geographically to the airlines that fed the different hubs. And this is more of an international play on this stuff. But then we took and one of the things you can do with Google Tag Manager, which is awesome, which most uh, not most, but some people do is you can track the dates of interest and the geographic location that the interest was generated from. Mm -hmm. And of course, the date that they were looking. So you have somebody that's in a location on a date looking for future dates. And we threw that all into Tableau and started creating correlations with confidence factors. If a rate, because airline people are very smart and they don't put mechanical on a lift unless they know they're going to get yield out of it. And they're certainly not going to up rate if they can't get the rate for it or lower rate accordingly. And we had to determine if lowering or, or, or dropping or raising rates was a, uh, uh, a direct correlation to our need to raise rates or lower rates, or was it an inverse? We found it was actually an inverse because if they were lowering, they had in mechanical, they increased inventory to lift, but they can't do the yield by rate yet. But we knew that there was more people coming from market. So we created the inverse correlation to it and started targeting, to your point, socially, the conversation in those markets, language based, talking about rates specific to the rate, uh, the date ranges that were of peak value at a threshold of 40 percent increase or above. And. The, the conversion was just off the chart. It was like you're walking into a little scratch dirt, make gold because right. you're right. now targeted the geographic location. The fact that the rates are lower for flights, which is the increased value proposition of coming to market correlated with the initial interest to market language based from that market at a rate that you're incentivizing them to be interested in pre booking on a long range book. It's just kind of one of those little fun things like you know, it doesn't work for everybody's market. Obviously, destination market, airlift, and of course, correlating all that stuff makes a data pool. You have to you have to kind of know you want to do this long before you ever think you need it. You need to know whether this is, you just can't say, hey, I got this crazy idea. Let's do this for, you know, rate demand in the next week. It's like you start building it now and you can figure out, you know, hey, maybe I could use this later kind of thing. Whoop. Sorry, I didn't, chart. I, 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 sorry about that. I hit that too soon by mistake. No, uh, let's go, go ahead, jump, jump, go ahead. I wanted to bring this up to go back to Stort's point. This is a hotel that I, I started doing some work with recently. And it, one of the things that they told me was email doesn't work, right? Well, and <laughs> I'm sorry? I need to love that one. Oh. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they said we've been doing email for the longest time and you know we do it periodically, but every time we do it, it doesn't work. Right. So I've had to anonymize this in terms of dates and times and all this other kind of stuff. Um, but notice those two peaks. You know, this this peak right here and this yep. peak right here. Guess what happened right at those peaks? I'd say an email got sent. <laughs> you got it. An email got sent. The problem that they had, the problem that they had was not that email didn't work. It was that they had their tracking set up incorrectly. Right. <laughs> This was all being funneled into direct navigation because of errors that that was that had been made with the tracking, and you know they're saying email doesn't work for us, and I'm like, look at this, you get a pop, and, and they had a huge list, they had a really good list, you know, and, but you know, but they clearly didn't send it regularly, you know, they were sending sporadically, um, 
but they were getting a, this nice pop every single time. But they just attributed it to, well, we got a lot of organic search that time for some reason, you know. And it, and I'm not trying to I'm not trying to call out the hotel. I'm not trying to like you know make them out to be the bad guys. It was the data wasn't helping them make good decisions. Um, but they also weren't looking at the data the right way, right? And but this is just to give an example of what you can do if you've got a good list, right? These these are folks who, by their own admission, they would tell you they weren't doing email correctly then, and it was having a positive effect, <laughs> right? right? So this just gives an interest. I've always I I thought this was interesting when I ran across it um, because it's a real. It shows the opportunity that exists. You know, if you look at all the other times, these are very flat periods, and then boom a pop, and boom mm -hmm. a pop. So. Yep. So Very yeah, true. There, Very true. when Stuart and I and Lauren all rant about email, there's a reason for it. Yeah. <laughs> it is the goal that it always has been, even though people thought it was a dead thing to use. But hey, do you guys use workflow pl uh, platforms at all? Generating workflow platforms of uh, conditionals. If I send an email, if they open it or don't open it, if they do, then they, this happens. If they don't, you wait X amount of time before this happens. Do you guys create workflow platforms? Yeah, yeah, we, we do in our, in our email system, fuel mail, we, we create call them drip campaigns, but basically a logic-based set of triggers based on what they do and don't do. Well, now, is it your your, your own platform that you're doing that on? Yeah. Correct. Oh, cool. Because I was, I was going to say, I've been, I've been messing with Autopilot, which is for if somebody doesn't have one. I mean, TravelClick has theirs. A lot of people have theirs. And I'm sure yours is much more superior to what I'm using. It's just, it's, it's been kind of fun because I can connect the social and the emails and stuff. And uh, that's another thing. Again, using an, uh, emails, it's not just a big red button that you hit saying, right. oh my gosh, we need this business on these dates. Right. Send an email. You know, it's like, no, that's crafting the personalization, crafting the timing, crafting the offer for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. We all play together. You know, what we do is we work with our clients to produce a master content calendar for the whole year across all their channels. So it's like blogs to social to email so that they're reinforcing the same. So. So the promotions or the campaigns that are running, we, we, we can pretty much predict that throughout the year. We might get a little fluid depending on occupancy and things like that, but we know, mm -hmm. you know when it's, it's vacation time or spring break or whatever it is, we know what campaigns we're gonna be running in, and that's omni-channel. I hate to use that word, so we use, but it's, it's across <laughs> every channel that we're, we're marketing on. So. Right. Right. So, and then you're never scrambling. You know, a lot of people that they do the reverse. They're like, "Oh, it's Wednesday. We're going to send out an email." What right, you? right. And and it's it's really really inefficient, and it's certainly not effective because you end up coming up with some half baked idea versus getting out ahead of it and planning. I mean, you can schedule your emails a long time in advance if you, if you have a plan and your social posts and and your blog content, so you can really get ahead of it. Well, and there's so many things that you know happen every year in your market, right? You know, there is the the 5K, there is the, you know, food and wine festival, there is the taste of town, right? There's, there's, there's holidays, there's, right, there's things that just are going to occur. There's things like concerts that you know are a big deal, right? Um, there's, yeah, holidays are a great one. I, one of my favorite stories, um, when I first started working at Wyndham, check your bingo card, um, um, I started there just before we were launching our big summer promotion. And everybody was running around with their hair caught on fire, uh, trying to get this thing shoved out the door and the like. Um, anyway, fast forward, and, and people were just, you know, we had 14 brands. All the brand managers are going nuts. The digital team is going nuts. Everybody's losing their minds trying to get this thing done. And in those days, the workflow was very, the brand did all the work and then handed it, you know, threw it over the wall to the digital team who then had to somehow make this show up on the websites and get in the emails and all this other kind of stuff. It was not well coordinated. It was not well structured. Fast forward 12 months and the, uh, the exact same thing is happening. Right now, we were a, a, a leisure hotel brand, largely, you know, and so we were sitting around doing a post mortem after everybody was all burnt out and crushed and crying and weeping and everything, you know. And uh, somebody said, "Well, this, this, uh, uh, you know, it's crazy that we keep doing this." And I said, "Well," I, and I asked the question. I said, "Can I ask one simple thing?" I said, "We're a leisure hotel company." Can someone explain how summer surprised us two years in a row? 
That's a well, brilliant statement. That well, is a no, brilliant I mean, statement. Like, you know, I mean, we know when Labor Day is. We know when Memorial Day is. And to Stuart's point, like, just put that stuff on the calendar. Like, this shouldn't sneak up on us, right? Yeah, you're going to have to deal with the short-term things. Yeah, you're going to have to have some flexibility and the like. You know, for some of my clients, we do the content calendar three or four months in, in advance for the for the uh, we do that we plot out the year. You know, here's Christmas, here's New Year's, here's Easter, here's spring break, here's whatever, here's whatever, here's whatever. But then for the intervening months, you know, some of some of my clients, you know, they're not sure. Depending on what's going on in market and things like that, you know, they might want to handle December a little differently as they get closer to it. Great. So we plot out, you know, a quarter. We plot out two quarters, and then on a rolling basis, fill it, flesh in the the third quarter as we get towards the end of Q1. Flesh, flesh out the fourth quarter as we get towards the end of Q4, uh, Q2 rather. Um, but summer doesn't surprise anybody, <laughs> you know? right? So it's, yeah, you got to have a content, you have to have a content calendar. You have to have those things mapped out. The great thing is it saves you so much time. Right? Yeah. I've done it once and it comes to the, because we've got some clients, we're, we're doing some of the planning out in, on an annual basis. Towards the end of the year, we'll have like next December's posts planned in some cases. Right. Because we know, you know, one of, one of the most effective things we've found from an SEO perspective is if I'm a hotel and I write, you know, something about, all the best place to watch fireworks at on 4th of July in, in this town, right? It's a very mm -hmm. popular blog post. I know when the traffic is going to start coming to that post and I know when it's going to peak and I know probably that it's going to change every year, but I now know when I have to edit that post versus writing a new post each year. What I do is I'll go back to the old post, update the date and change right. so like some of the content. So it's up to date. But then I keep all my search engine equity and it's going to maintain its rank and probably increase over time because I'm getting more links and things like that. So knowing when on my calendar I have to edit that piece just saves me a lot of time. And, 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 and I don't have to think about it because it's probably the same time every year. So it's just done. I do it once and for the next mm -hmm. 10 years I know when yep. that piece is Hey, so Melissa, who's listening, just says that your voice is a little low. I don't know whether your mic from the headphone is working or whether you're coming from the laptop or not. But no, that sounds like you. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like he's coming off the mic. Oh. Sturt's, Sturt's just sort of a mild mannered guy. He's a mild mannered. Yeah, <laughs> just he's very calm. <laughs> but you know, it, it kind of goes. Um, and and yes, to your point about the calendar and so forth. There's, I've been having. I mean, I've talked about Snipply before. And it's kind of like, you know, you have your self-generated content and then you have content that is just very good for your market that you can piggyback on and create your own call to action on somebody else's good content. And they both have value, but there's, again, there's a maturation in the, in the, in the, in the world now with these software programs that there's a lot of great automated solutions that are not mm -hmm. rampant automated that go crazy and do bad things for you, but that if you mitigate them well, monitor them well, and control them and schedule them correctly are invaluable tools that you can be always two weeks ahead of your curve at minimum for good, rich, developed content that you don't have to go, oh my God, it's Thursday at five, I got to post about this weekend. It's like, no, it's scheduled, locked, loaded, and done, whether it's a Hootsuite scheduling, a buffer scheduling, or a uh, amplifier or anything else, you know? I I agree with you, Lauren, but I would also say, uh, to Stort's point, uh, Stort is, you know, hitting them all out of the park today, uh, at least from my perspective, because I agree, I agree a thousand, I agree with every single thing he's saying, you know, your calendar should be set up yes. well in advance, right? Oh, yes. uh, you know, including things like, um, I'm glad you brought up SEO and, and Stuart, that's an amazing story about updating the post, the same post every year. That's a great point. Um, but including things, sorry, the, we have skylights. The sun is in a really bad spot at the moment. Um, you have an angelic glow to you now, Tim. <laughs> yeah. Um, in a minute, my future so my future so bright. I'm going to have to wear shades. Wear shades, yeah. Uh, um, no, but uh, you know, to the point where when we're putting things on the content calendar for December or for whenever, one of the things that's associated with okay, this week leading up to whatever is going to be themed. Let's, let's just do New Year's Eve. Let's just pick that as a specific thing. You know, as we're putting that on the calendar, we're thinking about what's the content that's going to happen and when is it going to land and the like. And 
during the planning process, what are the keywords we're going to target for that period as well? So when you sit down to write the post and things along those lines, or you sit down to create the content, you create the landing page, whatever it happens to be, you're already working from a, you know, a framework and a structure that says, we know what questions we have to answer for the guest. We know what keywords we want to make sure we target. We know what keywords, if we're doing any paid media around, that we're going to be buying to support this. So we need to make sure that the, the landing page covers those effectively and the like, right? We know what the call to action is and what objective we're trying to reach to. And that's planned way in advance. And it's, it's not something, you know, it's going to take you a couple of days, but you can take a couple of days at some point during your planning for next year and flesh out, you know, 60% or 70% of all the content you're going to create over the course of the next year. Mm -hmm. That makes it so much simpler. And the other thing that's great about it is you spot the holes. You spot the, wow, we don't have anything to talk about here. And mm -hmm. maybe the right answer in that week, month, day, whatever it happens to be is, okay, we're not going to do anything there because it's peak week for us. It's when we're super busy and great. Then we don't have to worry about it. Or it's, oh, that's a problem and we need to solve for that because otherwise we're going to lose you know, opportunities in the marketplace, right? You don't have to fill every box on the calendar. No, 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 you, no. You just have to make sure you're not leaving them blank by mistake. Right? No, it's like having a meeting with you don't need a meeting. It's, not, it's a useless right. tester to do content right. that you don't need. But to that point, you made two great things. One, I have a great case study to emphasize your point. The other is... Um, I am an advocate, a huge advocate that when you're the bell of the ball and where you're sold out rocking and rolling and you got business that you're turning away, you dial up your branding, you dial yeah. up your messaging because you have the audience to cultivate the relationship building, lead gen building, email list building, newsletter building, whatever it is that you create as communication values because you are the focal point at that time so that when it does turn barren and you can shoot a cannon down your hallways and not hit anybody, you have an audience to go back to to say, hey, remember when you were so wanting to come during springtime? We know it's September, but don't worry. We got some pretty cool stuff to, get, to offer you to make it worth your while. And you should be was, talking to our good friends at Flip2 and people like that about how they can help you do things just like that. Just like year. that. Um, but the other this is a case that i brought to you by. <laughs> Flip2 <laughs> forward slash Tim Peter. Um, <laughs> but I have a great case today with this. In Ottawa, I had a hotel, an independent hotel, and they have a tulip festival. Uh, very famous tulip festival, but this goes back a few years. There was no definitive anchor site that the website that they had for the event was atrocious, very, very thin, very almost like newsboardish. And uh, <laughs> there it is, yeah. Um, and so we built a landing page featuring the proximity and information related to the hotel with the Tulip Festival. And we yep. took it upon ourselves to add as much content, both that was available on the site for the, the event, as well as information that wasn't on the site. Well, that first year, it was okay. We did business and so forth. Next year rolls around, our page ranked organically number one for the event in search because the content dominated everything else in market, regardless of the fact that there was an actual website for the event because we had better more uh, better logistics, better content. And so our volume of traffic put us in the top of the list. So yes, to your point, that kind of content. Tim, you froze at a very interesting angle. You look like you were sleeping for a second. Um, oh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like when you put a, when you put the DVR, you pause it at a bit of an appropriate moment on the newscast or something. You get people that, you know, they got positions they probably wish you didn't catch them in. Uh, but anyway, that's a case study of proving your points. That's if you do good content. Yeah, we that with some of our clients and, and it's amazing. Most events do a terrible job of building their own website. So oh, yeah. just go Google anything that gets a lot of traffic to your destination, go Google and see what the top 10 pages results are and just do a better job of all of them. Take the best elements from all of them, put them all in some landing pages on your site and you have a good chance of ranking. Maybe not number one, but certainly top three or four and you're going to harvest a lot of, lot of visitors for that. Absolutely. But yeah, we... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just saying, as Lauren, I mean, it's hats off to Lauren. It's a great approach. Recommend. Um, I'm going. To, I'm trying to pull up a presentation that I do for Rocket. There's a slide that I use specifically to make the point of residual value. Google has a neat feature that if you um, uh, set up your goal sets and your event tracking on your website correctly, and for those who do, you know what I mean. Um, where you monitor what the successes are. Google will give you a wonderful dollar value as to what each page on your website contributes to your overall revenue generation. Yeah. Yeah. 
and it's a great, great tool. Now, let's see if I can be slick and like Tim and pull a stat page out of my presentation here. Oh, come on. Give me something here. I want my little page. I bet you I can't find it as fast as Tim. I can't find it. Dude, that sucks. Um, anyway, it showed two bar lines. I'm probably pulling the wrong presentation up is what I'm doing. Um, it shows two bar lines. One is the traffic line associated with the Facebook post. Now, as a way for everyone to understand, whenever you do a Facebook post, you should have a home for the content. Unless, of course, you're a brand hotel and you can't generate that all the time, then your, your page is your content or your posting is your content. But if you're ever going to go over and create posts in your Facebook, it should point to, as always, content that is in more in-depth to your site or at least a, a transaction page within your website that people, once they read more information, can act upon the information you've provided them. Something according to those lines is always helpful. So what I had as a chart, which I cannot find in my little list here, damn it. I was really stoked that I could try to show this. Um, the top line would have shown that we did a, ha a Halloween promotion and Facebook, and we had a corresponding page on the website related to the Halloween promotion. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. saw the spike in traffic for the traffic on social for it, and you saw a spike on traffic on the Google Analytics tracking for the traffic to the page. Well, shortly thereafter, that pro pro the, the Facebook post went zero. I mean, it had its effect, it had its traffic, and then it disappeared because the event passed. The uh, one on the website, you notice these little bumps and curls going over the course of the whole year. So it continued to generate. It ended up because it was used because of the content on it that Google said it generated another hundred and twenty thousand dollars because of its associated content value to your website, whether it was linked, bookmarking, shared, content search, whatever. It contributed based on the factors that Google uses a residual over the course of the year of almost ten thousand dollars a month in inclusion of the event itself. Mm -hmm. So even though it was a you know, nobody really looks for Halloween stuff in April, you wouldn't think, but there is reasons why people look for what they do, find what they find. It actually had a residual contribution of, of a lot of money. And so when you make this content, as the truth says, when it's on the internet, it's there forever. That value proposition persists after even the event that you created it for. So and you just gave me a great idea. I have a, I have a, I do these things for clients, you know, where we send out little updates and things that we call the fast facts, right? Uh, fast FAQs. And it's just different ideas and the like. If anybody contacts me via Twitter or email or whatever, I'll send them one that we did for just uh, keyword ideas, search engine optimization ideas and the like. But it's exactly that kind of stuff, right? It's obviously... I'm going to start with the things we're talking about, events, major national holidays, seasonal happenings, conventions, cultural events, festivals and concerts, local college and university graduations, college tours, family days, sporting events, uh, major and minor professional and college team schedules, PGA or minor league golf tour events, annual events such as Super Bowl, marathons, half marathons, bridge runs, local regattas, etc., right? Guest life events, weddings, honeymoons, baby moons, girls getaways, local college and university graduations, etc. So... And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff, but you can take these and start to flesh out. Okay, these are the things that we know are happening in market that we just need to talk about and have content around. And again, you can build that whenever you want and publish it live, you know, prior to the thing. You know, you, you don't have to leave it till the last minute and go, oh, we should do something about this. Plan out your content calendar, make sure you got the right ideas in place create the content as your schedule allows, and then hit publish when you're ready to. Yeah. When you need to. I'm, good. Just, I'm just going to do the screen share because I feel like I have to share this now. So <laughs> I'm, just, I'm going to go over and, and just do that. <laughs> but here was the example I was trying to point out to you. The top line is the Facebook spike. This is the Google Analytics spike. Of course, there was a high residual shortly thereafter. Over the course of the whole year, it had perpetual traffic even afterwards. So, again, to the point that, you know, these things do last longer than the purpose of their originally build. And to Stuart's point, you know, once you build it, updating it and continuing in perpetuity only adds its, its perpetual value as well. So, yeah, a mistake a lot of people do is they'll, re they'll create a new post each year for that event. And then they're starting from scratch each year, you know. So building upon the success of the previous year is much better. Make sure you keep the same URL. You don't have things like the date in the URL. Just change the, the H1 tag or the title to be the, the current year, but keep the URL the same. You're going to build a lot of equity over time. Yeah. Um, I, I do have to mention the fact that I have, I, I've designated myself the Chuck Yeager of testing stuff. Uh, 
because I will inflict a pain upon myself even when I don't intend to. Uh, I decided that there were certain tools I wanted to try in relationship to WordPress plugins and building things and templates and so forth because I was trying to work through a process for a client. So what better victim than to put it on my own website? Good news is it's really cool stuff. Bad news is it changed my entire permanent link structure and wiped out two thirds of my referral links. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, shit, because by the time the damage was done and then getting back from it anyway, so I'm going through this whole process of doing 301 redirects right now and so forth. But if you do go to my website, it has a really neat template that is far from finished and infinitely changed from what it was before because I had such a crappy website before because, as I always said, the painter's house was the last to be painted. But uh, right now, I've only redirected my 301 so far back through May. So <laughs> I have to go back even farther. This is the detriment of having 104 shows because now and, and, and 167 podcasts and for 21 marketing misses. I got to reroute all of the free 301s manually for all this. But at the end of it, it'll be a much cooler site and a little bit easier on the eye and a little bit more functional afterwards. But yeah, if I try, it's amazing. The, the, the templates and plugins you buy for those who are in the space and want to try to do stuff like this. And to that end, Holly, I think, is listening to us, but Holly made a huge decision recently, and she's going to go through a major programming course for six months, 30 hours a week to learn, to legitimately learn coding and programming. That's an amazing undertaking. I mean, She's going to turn into not only the smartest person, but really the smartest person in the room for all of us, because she'll tell us all the things we're doing wrong with everything we're doing. But uh, yeah, she's uh, she's starting that I think in October. So congratulations, Holly, if you're listening, because that's 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 crazy crazy dedication for. for <laughs> Suck the life right out of it. <laughs> Well, here, here's, here's the sad part. Here's, it, this is where I learned the lesson. So I went over, in order to load the template, you had to activate it to bring in all the plugins that went along with it. Well, one of the plugins was an automatic recrawl from Google. So as soon as I sucked in the template, found out it changed my permalinks, tried to switch it back to the original template before I got crawled, it auto crawled and wiped out my previous crawl already. So it already, the damage was done. I'm like, screw it, before I jump back again, I'll just fix what I have right now rather than going back to the old template. I was like. <laughs> Testing environment, staging environment. Yeah, because a, a fool for me is like, oh, I have to activate and bring the plugins in. Sure, click. Oh, shit. <laughs> so I am the Chuck Yeager of testing today. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to build a parachute before I hit the ground. <laughs> Thank you, Holly. It does look much better, but there's a whole lot of ungenerated content I need and links. And it's a, and of course, it has a, a template interface that is a total uh, a vertical learning curve for me. It's like, oh. Yeah, we can't see your beautiful face. Now. Oh, really? I see me. Hold on. Let me try it again. I'm going to turn it on, turn it off. Oh, okay. It just didn't click it on. It clicked it on once before. Sorry about that. Um, not that probably didn't improve the show by having it off, but <laughs> hey, um, there was a couple other links. Just one that I thought would be kind of fun to talk about. The chat box one is not so much, although it is interesting that chat bots are being finally considered for meeting planners because it is a great interaction tool. Uh, but the one that I thought was kind of interesting, well, again, shiny object syndrome. It's not something for anybody to be messing with if you're not in that space in the advanced stage. Okay. But neat that they're looking at it in the context of how to improve meeting planner engagement. Uh, can't, Holly can't see Tim. That's weird. There you go. Um, so the other article that I want to put in here, which I because I do have two clients right now that are restaurant driven or restaurant service driven. Sure.
Right. Well, it's like putting up a photo gallery and you don't have any pictures. If you don't have the content for the bot, doesn't care the technology. You don't have the, the backup for it. But uh, yeah, yeah, very true for that. Uh, no, the other article was the uh, the Chef Tech. Here, I'm going to cut and paste it right now, which was the restaurants because. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, ahead. Sorry, go, please. Sidebar about the, um, and I'm not going to say her name because it'll set off everyone that's listening on speakers. But Echo. Um, so you can, I went into the app, I was playing around with the app this week with my kids and we've got a couple in our house and we found out you can do the internal calls within the house, so you can like drop in. So my boys have one in their room, so I, instead of having to go up and scream at them in the morning to get out of, I can now just drop straight in, they don't have to answer it and I can scream at them that way, which is great. But when I was, when I was playing around with it and I was looking at what you can actually use as your trigger word now, you know, because you can use the, the A word I talked about. You can say Amazon, um, you can say Echo now, and there's a fourth one that got me so excited and I'm trying to convince my wife to, to let us switch to it because at, as you know, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, but I was also a huge Star Trek fan growing up too. Now you can use the word computer as the trigger word. Awesome, I didn't know that. Like you're on the enterprise and say computer and use your uh, Echo now, which is pretty cool. Oh, that's cool. I don't have it. I have the Google Assistant, so I don't know what they're going to allow us to do on that. Yeah. But uh, that is very cool. I would use that one. I would use that one. If I'd my be like, wife gives permission, I'm totally going to change, but I'm still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let me put the link up for the uh, Chef one. And the only reason I brought up that I thought was of interest to it is that it is, if, if you look in the context of hospitality as an industry in general, we often talk about how we, we, we've lost control of the message as most industries have with the advent of, internet, of the internet. The restaurant still has some controllability of its message because it is a self-contained product awareness to itself. Now, it doesn't mean you can't control the response to the product or the messaging from the product, but in, in the sense of controlling its description of product, from a website point of view, I thought it was an interesting point to be made that, you know, you do have the ability to use rich image graphics and 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 enhance what it is that you do and why you do. You, you have a better way of conveying the message of the ambience and so forth that I think hotels have lost. And eventually, I think restaurants are going to lose, too. But right now, they seem to have more of an influence on their ability to define their message outward than I think hotels do. Do you agree? OK. That's why I brought it in. I wanted to bring it in because I actually think there's a value idea to that. I don't think that hotels do a very good job any longer of conveying what their their ambience is, their presence, their their brand awareness is to their product. Yeah. I don't disagree. Do not disagree with that. I think restaurants, because they have a smaller context to be focused on, have still the ability to control their message better. Now, <laughs> and there we have it, friends. We have good A, like Stewie. Like <laughs> Stuart, you're in the middle. Split the deal. Split the deal. I mean, I think hotels. There's a, there's a homogenization issue that's gone on with hotels that is part of the problem in, in terms of how they present a unique voice or, or you know a unique brand position. But with restaurants, it's tough because because I think it's it's more in a way it's more experiential than it, than hotels because everything about it is you're going to that restaurant to go to that restaurant in a hotel a lot of times you're going to the hotel because of another reason right you're you're in town for whatever so I I think. The, the operational side, even though we've talked about how important operations is to hotel marketing, I think it's infinitely more important to restaurant marketing because you got people that are going to come back multiple times. A lot of locals and tourists are going to come back multiple times, either during their stay or throughout the year if they're local, based on the experience. You know, and, and the marketing has has very little to do with it. You know, I can think of my favorite restaurants in the world that I've been to dozens and dozens of times. I've never seen an ad from them. I've never been to their website. Um, you know, my experience or my exposure to advertising or to marketing from from restaurants is often if I've looked at TripAdvisor and found something, I might go and look at their menu online or I might look up the directions or I might look up their phone number. So I, th I think the brand is controlled by me walking in the door and how good the food was and more importantly, how good the service was. And so... If I was a restaurant, that would be where my primary focus is. Sure, I'd have a good website that had the menu and had pricing and had directions and had a way to call and and all that. But it, it's 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 review, reviews from peers are going to be more important, I think, than the website itself for a restaurant. 
Okay. I'll add a statement to this, Tim, to so give you my perspective a little bit to this. And that is the last time I thought that the hotels could convey a sense of in individuality or experience was when the heavenly bed was introduced. Because you're talking about enhancing the experience perspective of a stay that could be considered similar to everyone else. When you go to a restaurant, you have a signature dish or an ambience type that it, it, to, to Stuart's point, you have a shorter time duration, a more a specific reason for visitation. So more of a singularity of message of your uniqueness is able to come through on a restaurant's brand messaging than the uniqueness that now hotels seem to have lost. <laughs> Not working today. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I would be Bach. <laughs> well, I'm, I like it when I get to bring something that's like, no, I completely disagree. Because <laughs> we're seeing you fine, we're hearing you fine. Yeah, brother, at that point, yeah. I don't disagree with you in that statement, but I say that it only represents 10% or fit, even take the 20% of being luxury. I think it only reflects 20% of our industry as a whole. I think even restaurants, hold on, hold on, hold on. Eight, the homogeneity of brands, 
and as much as they try to diversify themselves, the homogeneity of brands, nobody goes over and says, I got to get me something. I would love to say it at Ritz Carlton every time I traveled somewhere, but I can only afford a certain thing or it's not available in market. But I can guarantee you there's a Greek restaurant in every town I go into if I want Greek food. And if there's a Italian restaurant, there's an Italian restaurant. And there's a more a specific mood to what you want with restaurants that are clearly identified. Right. And they all have their unique value brand proposition. idea. When you say Panera, you have a clear picture of what it is. When you say Marriott, you've got 31 flavors to decide from. And that's why I say 20% of the industry is independent hotel. I do not disagree with you. But that is an exception story, not a mainstay story. I, I would agree with you on Right. But the majority of Super 8s probably fall into the 48% category, not the 98%. Yeah, but in terms of how they approach it. Yes. Right. And, and I'm... And I do not disagree with it. And I don't disagree with you saying the content, if they're not doing it, they're not doing it right. I do not disagree with it. I'm just saying that a restaurant has more of an opportunity to craft that conversation than, huh? But there are good Paneras and there are terrible Paneras. Right. Right. Right, I think... I think That is a very good indicator of almost any food and beverage operation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my goodness. I, that, you know what? First off, I, I know you have to run tips, so I'm just going to go. I love when I get to go over and disagree about agreeing to something, but disagreeing in context. I appreciate the hell of that. And again, to reiterate the fact, being that it's anniversary nostalgia time, just, I sincerely appreciate all the time and all the years that we've gotten to do this, you know, back and forth as to yes and agree. Jane, you ignorant slut. You know, if we ran your business like you run your personal business, we'd have every two bit whatever. <laughs> but, you know, I, I love for that. I, I, I know you have to run for it, but I'm just going to say is that these are the kind of conversations for those who have joined us or not joined us over the course of the two years that makes this show very unique is that one, we're unabashedly not uh, embarrassed to go over and disagree. Two, usually it's in principle, not necessarily in purpose. And it always, out of all that conversation, I always learn something from the discussion that I didn't go into with it. You know, and I'm just, uh, in this case, I still disagree with you, but I agree with you. And, and everything you said is true. I just disagree in the context of the statement of what I said with the certain thing. But besides all that, for those who don't know, if they haven't already known, how is it that they can find more about you or what it is that you are passionate about or what it is that you do?
And again, thank you so much for all the time and all the commitment and all of this. Um, next week, I'm going to need all y'all's help with uh, the guest host because Friday, Thursday, I'm picking up the truck. Friday, I'm literally loading it, except for the time I spend on the show. So you can imagine my wife's prioritization is to brevity, sincerity, and, you know, get off the damn show. <laughs> and but, yeah, and but, I, but, will, yeah. I will be driving to Lubbock again on Fridays as I'm you, going you, to do. You, know, you should just start doing long haul trucking stuff to Lubbock and have a sidebar business for all the traffic you do. Just drive an 18 wheeler down there, make some extra cash wave business. On, yeah. when, I, when I make that drive, that is very much how I feel. So. <laughs> And, and this time, and this time, my my wife is not going with me, so I'm just helping my daughter, and I get to make the the beautiful five hour drive back alone, which is always fun. Uh, so. That's when podcasts come in. Hey, there's a great podcast you should listen to from Fuel Travel. If you don't listen to, it, it's the I, way you I subscribe. It's in, allowed, it, to that one too. it's in my Stitcher. It's in my Stitcher Stitcher Radio files. You bet. Such podcast for. It. Yes, except yours are yours are short, you know, Tim. Okay. But but he's got a lot of them. So you and can here, go back. Here, here, here to go back to my old conversation. If you'd like to listen to Hospital Digital Marketing Podcast, you're SOL for another day until I read. <laughs> and all I can say is I'm really sorry. I missed apparently a heated argument about ba um, bathroom cleanliness. I don't know, which no, is what a way to celebrate a second anniversary. So that's great. Uh, Again? Uh, Again? <laughs> it won't be the first time and definitely not the last. <laughs> Oh. oh. I don't know if it was potential. I think it was in actuality. I think you're more of an optimist and assume that more empirically. Yeah. yeah. And I don't disagree with that statement that if you're not doing it successfully, then you're doing it wrong for because it's content miss. But I say that right now, given the dilution of hotels compared to restaurants, restaurants have a stronger opportunity for brand awareness or understanding of what they offer as an experience compared to hotels now. Absolutely. Yep. I don't disagree with that opportunity. Tim, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That's all of us. It's not just me. It's you guys by far, too. I mean, come on now. You've been hanging out for two years. Well, Stuart, <laughs> Stuart was kind of a Johnny come lately. I mean, he, he saw the juggernaut and said, I, <laughs> I got to attach myself to that. Well, you got to figure out. <laughs> well, it's, like, it's like calling the guy that's with 10 year tenure the newbie because everybody else is 40 year tenure i mean he's been hanging with us for quite a while now <laughs> he, he's got the scars to prove it and, the, the, and the bills and the, <laughs> the bills from his analysts just keep racking up because of this. <laughs> i thought we were cutting the bills down i thought this was more therapy than it was anything else tim take care thank you bye We'll see you next week. Thank you. <laughs> Speaking of therapy, Mr. Ed's not here. He's enjoying the high life with the family up in, uh, was it Charlotte, I think, is it? Or Charleston. Charleston. Ah. Charleston or Charlotte? Which one I, thought, I thought you were going to spread a nasty rumor about Ed has Ed been sent to rehab or something like this, <laughs> which we can. Since he's not here, we can just start rumors like that. <laughs> He'd actually probably enjoy the fact we talked about him, regardless of whether it was for rehab or not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I, Except they sent the whole family to rehab. That's so disturbing with his children. I don't know. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, one last one. Uh, Master Robert, thanks so much for coming back. And I don't, I don't want to stretch it too far for us. No, no, but no. I, I threw up one last link just because it was a fun one. It wasn't in the pile that I had sent out originally. Just because it had some neat, fun little 
stats. Some of them, yeah, duh. And other ones were kind of like, oh, mind, you know what? That's kind of mind blowing stats. Wow. Uh, I didn't write the I didn't write the header, which was the the bait graph. Or, oh, oh, that's another thing. Just to, to to bemoan stuff about client engagements and so forth. When you start doing these audit things and so forth, mm -hmm. and going through the process, I think one of the most stark realizations that they don't understand is H1 referencing. And for those who don't know, it's your header one oh. referencing on your pages. Uh, when you're looking at SEO, you don't, or whoever does this for these people, don't realize the value impact of H1 when it comes to, H, uh, to, to your SEO value. And they will do these stupid statements in your H1 reference on a page that are either redundant to the page name, redundant to the content in the page, mm -hmm. or just badly written. And it, it totally destroys the value proposition of the H1 for that page. Yep. And it's just a minor gripe on my part, because as I go through this process in the auditing process with the people that are asking me to do these things, it's just like, guys, this is the basic bread and butter, nuts and bolts stuff, H1s, alt tags, ADA compliance. You know, we had one where it's like, am I ADA compliant? It's like, well, we're not going to do two-tone backdrops, but, you know, there are things you should be baseline doing, like, you know, oh, I don't know, alt tags. Yeah. They had, I don't know, almost 900 really crappy images, some of which had the Getty white label still on it, the watermark still on it. Nice. That's oh, good. Yeah, so people like, hey, can see where you got that image. You know, it's only 900 bucks a pop for bad violation usage, not to mention yeah. they'll track your butt down no matter where you go. Uh, <laughs> but it, all of them, no alt tags, not a single alt tag on all of them. Like, guys, where are you hosting this stuff? Where you, I mean, I, we need to get Henry from Ice Portal on to start giving us the riot act on image uh, modifications oh, and so all on. That's Phenomenal man for those Caption, who don't know Henry with Ice cap, Portal. Yeah. yeah, caption, all the stuff. All oh, my like God, yes. Bit. Yeah. But anyway, just uh, that little list there. Is there anything that just, you know, we got a couple minutes left before my wife starts beating on the door wondering why I left her alone at the garage sale for two hours? <laughs> uh oh well she can re she can certainly wreak her revenge with that so. oh i'll uh, be paying for it later guess who's lugging in the entire garage sale once it's over because of that <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly um oh actually with your garage sale um have you found a uh any sort of charity like a church or something who will then haul all the leftover stuff away as a donation and give you a donation receipt when you're done? There are, there are those there, but actually we're going to be doing it to the, uh, the, 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 the shelter here and they can't pick up large quantities of stuff, which I'm assuming we're going to have left over. So uh, when we get the truck on Thursday, we're going to pile it all in first thing and bring it down uh -huh. for them to, to use. Cause we, we have a soft spot for puppy sal uh, saving and stuff like that. So uh uh, we'll make the extra effort to get it to them rather than uh, just give it away to the convenience of a church that can do it. Not that they don't do good stuff. Do not get me wrong. It's just we wanted to pick and help the puppies. So, well, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you and I still have to do lunch uh, in this next week. This is this is my last week in Dallas as a resident. After that, it'll be uh, as a visitor again. So, yeah, that's right. Well, through Wednesday, I am around. So uh, I'll have to figure a time for that. Stuart, are you ever going to make it? Do you make it to Texas at all, or do you just uh, stay in the land of? I've only been to Texas one time. Anaheim, no, uh, uh, where Austin for a, is it high tech. Uh -huh. One of the conferences. Might be oh, there. okay. Uh, yep. I, oh yeah, I remember ooh. high tech in Austin? Yeah, we did high tech in Austin uh, two years ago. No, three, three years ago. Now. Yeah. Three years ago now. Yeah, yeah three years ago. That's the only time I've, I've been to Texas. So. <laughs> That's Austin is very nice. Austin's a really <laughs> neat. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the rest of Texas is hit or miss. In how's Texas. Lubbock these days, there, Robert? <laughs> Lubbock, Lubbock is a is a actually a. a cool little little town very much like being back in the 1950s in many aspects but uh but my daughter loves it i mean it, it's great she loves you being should just buy a there. house out there and do this back and forth and she stays in it while you're not there oh, no no a, fr a friend of hers their parents bought her a house basically and is going to rent it out and she has roommates and those roommates basically are paying for the house for the uh, for the parents, right? It's a classic kind of rental property. Their daughter's living in it kind of rent free. The other three, you know, rentals, you know, are covering the, you know, basically covering the mortgage, and uh, they're making a turning a little profit. And they have another child who's probably going to go to Texas Tech, and so they're going to have this probably for five or six. Years. And who knows? After that, they may just wind up renting it out to people. So yeah. Stuart, now you haven't had a vacation yet, have you? Or did you sneak away and we just didn't know it? Uh, I, I took a week off with, to hang out with my kids, but we're going actually going to a little island called Crip Island next week after next. So Crip? Crip, F-R-I-P. Oh, Crip. Yeah, Where's that? South Carolina. Um, 
yeah, down the other side of Charleston. So. Ah. Very quaint little. You know, I live in Myrtle Beach, so it's like I'm always on vacation. We, we yeah, yeah, yep. yep. That's what's hey, gonna. Did you don't get any pushback from everybody having to get evacuated off of the uh, Outer Banks? Did you get any residual bump from them having to relocate or anything? No, it, we didn't see any kind of bump. We looked at it to see if we were. You know, the only time we've ever really seen a major push from something like that was when the the Gulf Coast had the big oil spill. We saw a oh. ton of traffic come from from that. Like people down that used like Alabama, Kentucky that usually yeah. went down that way were coming up to Myrtle Beach instead. Okay. We kept a few of them, but for the most part, it's gone back to, to normal. But yeah, we didn't right. see a lot. Only, it only affect, I don't think there's that many units there. I think it was like, what, 3,000 people were evacuated? Um, yeah, well, I mean, and it was also, yeah, yeah, yeah it wasn't going to be a huge earthquake, but yeah. Long term, so yeah, we didn't really notice a big boot. Uh, God, can, you, can you imagine the scramble of that, trying to figure out reconnoiter? Because that's, that's your big cash time, and to have all your business be told to leave, mm -hmm. I mean, that's... Yeah. That's crushing. That's. I, I hope that they do something like the oil spill. Oh, and it's taken them a while to get it fixed too. Is the, yeah. yeah, it's no short. Like, oh, it's a day or two, and everybody comes yeah. back. It's like, no, this is two weeks yeah. at peak business. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. so I hope that they figure out some things with uh, either hurricanes or we've had flooding a couple of times that have affected us, which have had similar impacts. But yeah, it's 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 never been like that where the whole island is is evacuated. Yeah. No, not good stuff. Well, uh, but with that said, we are at that time-ish, kind of shortish. But hey, um, so Mr. Stewart, if people want to find out other than the podcast we keep ranting about, more about fuel travel or yourself. <laughs> I think it's raving about. It would be better than ranting about. Just oh, good point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the podcast is fueltravel.com slash podcast. There was a last week's episode was about email, as you mentioned. We, we actually got a special guest next week. We got... Um, Valerie from Trust You is going to be on it, and they're going to uh -huh. talk about the study they did, which is interesting. It looks at the the correlation between engagement with your guest on property and guest satisfaction and ratings and things like that. So um, that's going to be exciting. And then we need to get you guys on the podcast at some point. Yeah, we yeah. I promise that once I get settled into Florida, I'll be bugging you about that. I'd love to okay. join. I would be very flattered. And then you but, can get um, us on Twitter at Fuel Travel, and then me at, at Stuart Butler as well. Awesome. And Mr. Cole, for having been, then come back again. And uh, you know, just uh, for those who want to know more about your mysterious side, where can they find what you do? <laughs> no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to post anything about my mysterious. Side. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Although I'm sure it's not nearly as mysterious as Lauren's mysterious. Side. Well, I've hidden. I've I've done a very good job of hiding my mysterious side by totally destroying my website temporarily. So. Okay. Oh, well done. Yeah, you missed the part where I, I dropped in a template to update stuff and it wiped out all my permalinks and oh, then yeah. auto crawled itself so I couldn't go backwards. It, you know, I, 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 as I mentioned earlier in the show, I turned into the Chuck Yeager of website plugin uh, testing. <laughs> my, my favorite was a particular client uh, I wound up working with whose previous group they, they had on their website. Um, they had put the. Uh, uh, robots.txt, yeah, you know, like don't fault, you know, sort of thing, and totally, you know, did a new site, oops, forgot some, totally blew themselves away for like, I uh, yeah, took like, what, 45, 60 days to come back. <laughs> so, uh, just un, un, it won't be that long, but I will be, uh, right now, there's a huge, wonderful void on hospitality podcast dead links that you can easily capture any traffic interest whatsoever since now all of the redirects are totally crapped out so well, yeah anyway mr cole where can the people anyway, find you at at robert day ah, at robert k i gotta practice saying my name yeah that would be that would be helpful uh, <laughs> at uh, robert k cole through most social media or rockcheetah.com outstanding and again a sincere and genuine thank you for for all the shows and everything and just participating in the time spent and uh you know it, it, it but like i said when i started the show this morning and i'm sitting there talking to myself i'm like this would suck for most people if i was the only one they ever heard about because i'm by far not the smartest one in this group so it's gonna be a lot about opinions and a little hand and, bubbles, and you know i th i think everybody who's on this feels that way except ed so <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Robert. I feel so reaffirmed now. Now I need to increase my therapy. Uh, yeah. but anyway, uh, so we have hit the two-year. I get to change all my advertising to not nearly two years, but now over two years, because after the end of the show, 
We are officially over two years and going. So there you go. Uh, oh, Holly, oh, we got a we got a laugh out of Holly. You got a laugh out of Holly. And Holly, thank you as always too. Even though you're not visually on the show, thank you so much. Right now, you know, visually on the show today. You've been many times on the show and an ardent supporter for uh, the whole entire time. And thank you also very much for being that person. With that, we can wrap up 104. And uh, gentlemen, thank you again. And uh, hopefully, like I said, I'll need your help next week because I'm probably going to be the short time person on the show uh, this upcoming week. We do have a guest host, uh, Jonathan, uh, from uh, NewsCred, which is, we talk about content. It's a content gen uh, site. Uh, be interesting to kind of corner him on some things. I want to ask him about some of the... Uh, functionalities, I guess. I don't know a better way of saying it. But anyway, it'll be a fun conversation. I hope that you guys can uh, see it in your schedule. So with that, I think we are done. Gentlemen, thank you very much. We'll see you next week. That's great. <laughs>